we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I need an ABLE assistant. Do we have a student in the group? Who would be my assistant? Sure. Come on up. What's your name? Dryden. When I elbow you, I want you to hold it up high. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Welcome to the cemetery tour sponsored by the genealogy section of the Fulton County Historical Society. We're a small but mighty group and we're interested in genealogy and if you'd like to join our group um, we have applications on the table where you came in. If you're interested in your family history you're always welcome to uh, use the genealogy resources at the Fulton County Historical Museum. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> Dryden, my able assistant, is showing you the newsletter, the Fulton County Folk Finder, that's published twice a year. It is for sale at the Fulton County Museum, and if you join, it will come to you free in the mail. Okay. You can keep that. Oh, that's right. okay. I'm Caroline Jones, the president of the group, and I will be your tour guide today. Our group noticed that other towns had presented interesting cemetery tours, and so we decided to put on our 2016 schedule as part of our mission to bring um, the past alive to everybody in Fulton County. Today you'll see gravestones and hear the stories of six local citizens who contributed in one way or another to our community. A little bit about this cemetery. It was founded by the Rochester Lodge of the Independent Order of Odd Fellows back when our uh, city was brand new. And the first burial was that of Catherine Ross, and she was buried here in 1856. The Board of Trustees and the Lodge and their employees operate and take care of this cemetery, and we'd like to thank them today for working with us to make this tour possible. Thank you for coming and enjoy the tour. The first stop on our tour is Colonel Isaac Brown, <laughs> portrayed by Shirley Kern Needham. Yeah, I'm going to If Please let me know if you can hear me. I tend not to like to use those. You can't hear me. All right, never mind. There you go. <laughs> I'll, I'll echo you to death here. <laughs> um, I am today portraying uh, Colonel um, Isaac Washington Brown who until Shirley contacted me to do this, I did not know existed. Turns out that he was actually quite famous, and I don't think most of Rochester knew that he was here too. Um, the Audubon Society mounted this for him in the 1930s. Um, this is my busy time of the year with birds, so I didn't have time to do the kind of research, which I think I'll do over the winter. Um, he, did a, he was a very prolific writer and a very prolific speed, speaker, and yet I couldn't find a single article that he had written or a single speech that he had written. So I'm just going to have to kind of pretend I know what the title of his speech was, so I'm just, and I know what the dates were, so I'm just going to have to kind of pretend I know what he was talking about. <laughs> Pardon me, Shirley, if I get a little flights of fancy here. <laughs> Well, we it is birds, that. all right. <laughs> you want me to hold the mic for you? That's all right. I can get it as soon as I get my glasses on. Um, colonel Washington was actually born, he, and he wasn't a colonel, by the way, and I haven't figured out exactly why he ended up with that nickname. That's also going to be part of my research. Uh, he ran away at age 16 and joined the Civil War, the 135th Infantry Division. He never saw battle at all. He, in fact, he said that the Civil War was fun because he never he never got close to a battle. And where he came up with the nickname Colonel, we it isn't it isn't written in anything that I could find. Um, he was born actually in Carroll County, uh, which is down towards uh, Delphi, uh, in 1848. Um, raised on a farm, his father was a farmer all of his life, but. Uh, Isaac, who I'm going to refer to him rather than the whole title, if he were, um, if a psychologist worked with him today, they would probably label him adult deficit disorder. 
he jumped, he, he would get very, very excited about something and become very, very proficient at it and then fail and lose all of his money and then he would go out and make money and then come back and lose it again. Did this multiple times, ended his life just on his soldier's pension, which wasn't much. Luckily, he had good friends here in Rochester. Uh, one of his neighbors and close friends was um, the former Congressman Barnhart, who, of course, I assume that's the Barnhart that ended up, the son founded the telephone company, right? Henry Barnhart. Yeah, Henry was the father and, and Hugh was the telephone company, right. Uh, but um, he actually, the first thing he did after he came home from the Civil War was joined a law firm. And of course, back in those days, you didn't have to go to law school, you just joined a law firm. Uh, he discovered right away that that was not his forte at all, and he lasted two years there. He married a young lady from here in Rochester by the name of Emma Strong, and she's got in one of these tombs here, I can't remember which one, maybe that one. And um, we know nothing about her whatsoever except that they, they supposedly loved each other dearly had three children, one of whom is buried here, that only made it to the age of three, but the others lived through adulthood. And then after that, we know nothing more about them. Um, after he kept, he, he would go to Chicago and was involved in the Chicago Board of Trade and um, actually became very good at crop inspections. Came home one time um, with actually six thousand dollars, which was back in those days a lot of money, the late 1800s. And he opened up a meat market and failed. He opened up a hotel and failed. <laughs> then he would go back up to Chicago and make more money and come back again. One of the things that he finally decided that he he wanted to enjoy. He was a great big redheaded guy who was always sort of disheveled from what we can understand. That's, that's for my ad <laughs> and the fact that I didn't iron my shirt this morning. <laughs> and I, um, he, he was so energetic and so outgoing and I think probably a, a, a little overwhelming to some people, but because of his childhood background, he knew all of the birds and animals in the area and he'd been one of his big things were insects and uh, but birds also and so he learned how to imitate all of the bird calls which made him really special it's something I've always wanted to do and can't it's just not in me so he would he decided to start writing 20-minute speeches and he didn't have the money for even a horse so he would walk to these schools and just show up and basically bully his way in the door and convince the teachers to let him give a presentation to the children on birds and the bees. And thus he became known as the bird and bee man of Indiana. Uh, he eventually uh, got a wealthy lady on the East Coast, Derrytown, New York, to financially back him. And she bought him a lifetime pass on the Erie Railroad. So that expanded his horizons considerably. In fact, I really miss the old, you remember the Erie Lackawanna? We used to take it into Chicago when we were kids. That's showing my age, isn't it, Dick? <laughs> miss the railroad. Um, but he would ride all over the country. He actually ended up giving speeches uh, in every single county in Indiana. But he also went in other parts of the United States, and part of the funding that he was given was to go down to Texas and do research on the exciting bull weevil. <laughs> and of course, that was important in those day and age because it was destroying the cotton crops. At the same time that he was doing all of this research was a time when we were very rapidly driving birds extinct. Um, he watched the passenger pigeons be completely wiped out. He watched the Carolina uh, parakeets being wiped out. They were working real hard on, on the white egrets. So that was his speech when he went around to, to all of these kids. Don't kill the birds. Unfortunately, he died in 1914. They passed, in 1916, they passed the International Migratory 
Bird Treaty. That was to protect all of the migratory birds in the Americas that traveled up and down the migration routes. The United States didn't sign on to it until 1918. He missed that. And I can't find anything. We just have to assume that he had to have been fairly important, or why would the Audubon Society come out and, and put up this, this uh, uh, really nice plaque? We have to assume he was fairly important on helping get that passed here in the United States. And what that law does is, and of course it, it also affects the migrations as they move up and down the Americas, but it makes the collection of nests, feathers, eggs, and the killing of almost any bird in the United States illegal. It's illegal to have them in your possession without a permit. It's illegal to collect the feathers. I do have a permit, thank you very much. And uh, plus these are not protected feathers. That's a turkey. <laughs> Anything that's, the, that's a game bird, you, you can have, you can get the feathers. But any other feather, and I mean, look back at my childhood. I, I had, I mean, my room was, was like a museum. Somebody asked how it would be decorated. It would be decorated in an early Audubon. And it was illegal. It's illegal to pick up feathers, eggs, nests. And it is illegal to have the birds in your possession for more than 24 hours. You are allowed under the Good Samaritan Law to rescue a bird and then get it to either a conservation officer or a wildlife rehabilitator. And so he missed all that. And, and it was very, very critical. Uh, there's only three birds in the United States that are not protected. Anybody want to make a guess? Dick, you don't get to guess. You probably know. Sperling, house sparrow. What's the third one? Rackles? Pigeons. <laughs> Which are actually, their real name are rock doves. But it's rock doves, uh, house sparrows, and uh, English starlings. Those are the three birds in the United States that are not protected. All other birds are protected. Yes, we do hunt some of them, but you have to have a license, and it has to be at a particular time of the year. So I really think it's sad that he didn't live long enough to, to get to see all of this happen, because he probably had a, a really great, um, uh, he was behind it all, uh, one of the people behind it. Uh, does anybody have any questions on it? Because I can't remember, I mean, there's so much uh, on here. I'm sorry? Oh, that's a, right. He came home from Chicago, up there trying to make money again, and he got off the train and went home to his wife and said, I think I'm dying. And uh, the one obituary I read said he died of acute indigestion. Now that sounds like a heart attack. But then another one that I read, that was his official obituary uh, in the Rochester paper, said that he that he did come home from Chicago with acute indigestion and then it went into bronchitis. That's, and he, three days later he was, he was gone. And that was in 1914. And his wife then didn't die until 1937, but I, I really know absolutely nothing about her. Another thing that I'd like to know is his, while he was in the Civil War, his father moved from Carroll County and uh, bought a farm out by Lake Manitou. I, I, I'd really like to find out where, I mean, did you ever find that in any of your research? No, but if you ask, uh, did you go to the courthouse? No, the no. lady across the street. It needed divorce. Yeah, I need Oh, it. of course. <laughs> could tell you. I'll bet she could. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to know where at Lake Manitou, because of course even the shape of Lake Manitou has changed through the years because of the dam and the fish hatcheries. So uh, that, uh, that would be fun to find out. I'm, uh, my ancestors originally were from the Scottish borderlands with England, bloody area, and some were uh, forced to resettle in uh, what is now called Northern Ireland. My father, John Wiley, uh, and I was in. Uh, I was born in 1895 in. Uh, in uh, Monroe County, uh, what's now West Virginia. But uh, then it was Virginia. Virginia was a, a big state in those days. It rivals Texas, you could say, today. 
in size. And uh, my father uh, fought in the Lord Dunsmore War, which was an Indian war, prior to uh, about the time of the Revolutionary War. And what was interesting, he said that many of his fellow comrades, uh, we ended up fighting each other in the Revolutionary War. For myself, I'm one of nine veterans here in Fulton County uh, that was in the War of 1812. Now, my hat is rather fancy, but it does uh, simulate the hat that we wore as soldiers, but it was a little more ornate, you know. You can see these pictures with uh, Anthony Wayne and uh, at the Battle of Fallen Timbers. You can see our troops in uh, various display there. Modern artist has captured that. But I, uh, I uh, enjoyed uh, the, the East, but uh, opportunities opened up here in, uh, after the uh, Potawatomi's and the other tribes were removed from this part of the state. So, uh, leaving the farm, and I didn't have much, uh, my father, we had a big family, and uh, I received a few shellings, but my brother, uh, he received the farm. <laughs> so I had to move on. And I, remar and I married uh, Rebecca Burns. Uh, Burns, of course, is uh, another prominent Scottish name. As you know, Bobby Burns, our uh, national poet of Scotland. But, uh, Yes, my roots are, again, Scott-Irish, and uh, my wife and I, Rebecca, she was just a young lass, and uh, we married, uh, she was not even 18, and uh, we moved out here in about 1834, I married in 1827, she was a young girl. I, again, I was born in 1895, fought in the War, of, uh, the War of 1812, and I was just a young fellow then, I was 18. I didn't really see any bloody action or anything uh, against the British in that war. Uh, most of it was actually confined to the coast uh, with the English. As you know, they burned Washington, by the British. And, uh, but we got it back from, it was more or less the Second Revolutionary War. But I came out here with my wife, and there was opportunity. Land was opening up, and I became a farmer here, at first in Richmond Township, where my son, my second son, uh, George Washington Wiley, was born. And, uh, if, in fact, he was the uh, first uh, child in Richland Township to be born there. And, uh, uh, well, we farmed and we worked hard. And uh, we eventually acquired a farm, farm here in uh, Rochester Township. And things went pretty well, and uh, we got up to about the time of the Civil War, and I died in 1861, right at the very beginning of the war, as you know. 65. I sometimes wonder, brother against brother, I sometimes wonder that war should not have been fought, but we fought it anyway. So we were some, some of us were reluctant, even though most of us here are the Hoosiers, we were rough and tumble. We were a pretty uh, good unit. In uh, Virginia, I served with the 4th Regiment under a, a Captain Andrew, and I was only in there for less than a year, but I had, uh, and I was paid eight dollars a month and I uh, in mileage home and uh, I had about a hundred dollars when I left uh, left uh, what is now West Virginia so uh, yes and um, my wife continued to live on she's not buried here beside me I noticed and uh, she lived <laughs> that me really all that but uh, she lived on till uh, about 1895 so she died in her 80s where I died uh, when I was 60. Uh, um, 1895, about 60, 61 years. It wasn't, uh, wasn't a long life, but it was uh, a good one. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you here. If you didn't hear him when he introduced himself, this is Alan McPherson from Kiwana. He's a member of our group. And uh, he knows he doesn't have any shoes on and he's got dirty feet. He said that's that's the way that Robert Wiley would have been when he came back from the war and he was a farmer, so thank you. Our third stop on the tour is Nellie Babcock. She was Rochester's first and only woman mayor and she's portrayed by Maria Kelsey. Oh, good morning. What a lovely crowd. How nice of you to come and see me. I don't get to meet that many people these days. 
So I guess you want to know a little bit about me because um, I wouldn't be on this tour if I weren't something special. I know we're all something special, but I was, after all, the first woman mayor of Rochester. And, you know, I think I should start at the beginning. I was born, and I brought a list of, of details because my memory isn't what it used to be. You know how that is? Um, so I was born on a farm in Fulton County in um, 1868, yes, December 7th, 1868, just three years after that terrible, terrible war between the states. Oh my goodness, people were still recovering. It took decades. Anyway, um, I was born on a farm in Fulton County and um, went to school like everyone else does. I really loved school, especially science. And the boys. I really did like the boys, but then all the girls did. And I was not one of those silly girls who's always fixing her ribbons and no, no, I was a good student. Um, I didn't meet Leonard. Leonard was my husband. I didn't meet Leonard in school. I met him at church. We were Baptists, lifelong Baptists, and um, we were both in the choir and he sang a little bit off key, but he was so nice and so kind, and people teased him because he was short. But I liked him, and eventually we walked out, and he would come out to the house for Sunday dinner, and, um, you know, we fell in love. And so, um, my, you should have seen that boy play baseball. <sighs> anyway, as um, soon as I turned 18, we got married. It was, let me check the date. Wouldn't it be awful if I forgot when I got married? Um, December 11th, 1886, right after, almost to the day when I turned 18. We got married and we had a farm, a small farm, but we had a plan. All those times we'd go, go taking rides in the country in a horse and buggy or walking around the farm, we had a plan and our plan was to go to dentistry school. I see people making strange faces, but dentistry was very exciting back then. It was so much different from what it used to be. We had these drills. I was very good at the drill. I could pump it faster than Leonard, and you would pump it with your foot. It was amazing and much less painful than the old way. I don't even want to talk to you about the old way. Um, there, we didn't do bleedings or anything like that. So Leonard and I had a plan, and after seven years saving every penny and every dime we could, we both enrolled at Northwestern University Dentistry School. Four years later, we both graduated. He became Dr. Leonard Babcock, and I became Dr. Nellie Stevens Babcock. I was very proud to sign things with the DDS after my name. So we were dentists. Um, we built our, our practice. Some people would think he would been. I would have been better with the children, but actually he was. He was. Leonard was so charming. And eventually that charm and his honesty and his hard work led to him being elected mayor in 1930. I'm going to check. 1935, I believe. Isn't it a good thing I, I kept notes? Um, yes. So he was elected mayor. And one of the things he gave himself as a gift for being mayor was a new automobile. Oh my, he loved that automobile. It was just a Ford. He said it was the best car he ever drove, but it was only the second car he ever drove. <laughs> Unfortunately, the automobile led to Leonard's demise. He was in an automobile accident and never really quite recovered. And in October of 1938, he died of heart disease. Oh, how I cried. But you have to move on. I had the business to take care of. I had property taxes to, pl to pay. And then, besides having the business, the city council asked me if I would complete Leonard's term as mayor. So I did, and I became the first woman mayor in Rochester. And uh, there's newspaper clippings. I brought some with me. It made, it made newspapers not all over the country, even in other countries. Well, Canada. <laughs> um, 
Where am I clipping? <laughs> Leonard was really the organized one. Oh, they're here somewhere. Clip ah, there they are. The Montreal Gazette. This is what they said. It doesn't mention my name, but I know I in I know I inspired it. November 22, 1938. Time was when women figured infrequently in the news except in the social column, club, and church notes. This has long ceased to be true, but it gets better. Will Rogers, you remember who Will Rogers was? Will Rogers read about me live on the radio. This is what he said. I see by the papers that women are very actively engaged in all manner of pursuits, most of them to their credit. Let's take as an example, from Rochester, Indiana comes this item, an elderly widow, not so elderly, an elderly widow who worked many years with her husband as a dentist took his place at its head of Rochester City Government today as Indiana's only woman mayor. Mrs. Nellie Babcock was chosen by the City Council to serve until January 1st. I was so proud of that. Will Rogers, can you believe it? So let's see, what else do I have to tell you? Um, I died, of course. But we all must. Um, there might be, are there any Babcocks or Willards around here today? I'm one of them. You're a Willard? Do you remember me, Aunt Nellie? Billy? <laughs> yeah. Oh my, it's Billy Babcock. It's so good to see you. Well, I remember when Uncle Leonard worked, pulled one of my teeth. He did, he did. My two brothers and I had to sleep in the same bed, and Gene was fighting with Bob, and he sleeped over, and he missed Bob and hit me in the mouth. Oh my goodness. Was about 10 at night. We came over to your house, and Uncle Lance oh, killed I my remember, teeth. Oh, yes. And then after you moved uh, over to uh, the hardware store, above the hardware store, Black and Bailey's, yes, I yes. come and see you. Yes, you were such a nice little boy. Oh, it's so I'm nice glad to you see told you. That. Oh, I was going to mention you. <laughs> wow, that's great. Isn't that marvelous? <laughs> well, sir, anyway, then I died. Um, <laughs> I was, as I mentioned, a lifelong member of the Baptist Church. I had a funeral there. It was a lovely spring day, and they brought me here to the cemetery. I died May 7th, 1959, and boy, did I get to see a lot of changes in my life. And here you are visiting with me. Thank you so much. This was delightful. If you don't mind, I think I'll walk along with you. Okay. This is his government-issued stone, and uh, he's being portrayed today by Austin Utter, who's a junior at Rochester High School. And Austin graciously agreed to put on the heavy wool uniform and stand here in August <laughs> <laughs> to do this for us. Shirley Willard is going to read us and talk to us about Samuel Miller, so here's Shirley. Thank you. Uh, we're real glad to have you, Austin. <laughs> He's about the third or fourth person that agreed to and then kind of had to back out for circumstances or sickness or something. Uh, Samuel Miller was written up in Home Folks, which was Marguerite Miller's book uh, about the old settlers. And um, I have a <coughs> thing here which has his picture. Uh, can't hold too many things here with one hand. <laughs> yeah, if you'll, you'll get back over here by me, you can hold some of this stuff. <laughs> oh, you have Hold that so they can see it. <laughs> there he is uh, in that picture wearing his uh, GAR medal, which was the Grand Army of the Republic, a uh, club for Union veterans. Samuel Miller was uh, born in 1834 in Gettysburg, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. His family lived on the future battlefield. His parents died when he was 12. He told his life story in Home Folks, and I've got a paper clip here in Home Folks with you. He did. A paper clip? The first one, yeah. 
same picture, I think, but that's what it was in, uh, Margaret Miller was a newspaper woman here, and I'm going to tell you about her, because I'm portraying her at the next grave, I think. Anyway, um, he uh, traveled to Virginia and saw slavery, and he was saddened by the way they were herded like cattle, sold, and he even saw one hung for murder of another black man. He moved to Fulton, Indiana with his brothers and worked in the store, the hotel, and on the blank plank book board, you know, plank road between Logansport and Rochester. At age 28, he talked with several friends and they all decided it was their duty to join the Union Army. They walked to Rochester and enlisted in the Indiana 5th Cavalry Company I, 90th Regiment, August 11th, 1862. They rode in a two-horse wagon to South Bend, then by train to Indianapolis. They stayed there until late in the fall and helped build a barracks, for which he was paid 26 cents a day. There they were assigned horses. They were stationed first at Rising Sun, Indiana, on the Ohio River, and then in Kentucky. They chased General John Morgan as he and his Confederates invaded Indiana. His unit lost its first death, Henry Heckethorn, in Kentucky in May 1863. Heckethorn was the brother of Nancy Heckethorn, the wife of Joshua Willard, and that's Bill's uh, great-great-grandfather, Joshua Willard. So by reading this, we found out more about Joshua Willard that we didn't know. For instance, I didn't know if he took his own horse or if they assigned him horses, and they assigned horses to them, so he we know then that he did not take his own horse. But I didn't know about Henry Hickathorn being his brother, things like that. They fought in numerous skim skirmishes and battles across Kentucky and then crossed the Cumberland Gap and he fostered his thighs from sleeping on frozen ground. He went home on furlough. Upon his return, his regiment went into Georgia, being under General Sherman on his march to the sea. Miller was in the battle at Kennesaw Mountain. Have any of you been down to see any of these uh, Civil War battlefields? General Sherman said the Indiana 5th Cavalry was his favorite. He sent them with General Stoneman on a raid south of Atlanta to cut off the railroad. This was successful, so Stoneman decided to go on south to free the prisoners at Andersonville. Bad decision. They were captured and taken to Andersonville, and most of them stayed there till the end of the war. General Stoneman, of course, was, uh, what do they call it, paroled when they released him or switched him or something, but swapped him for some other officers or something, but the poor enlisted men had to stay there, and Andersonville was a terrible place. Miller described Andersonville, oh, how awful it was. It had 32,000 prisoners on 20 acres. Andersonville was a prison pen instead of a building. It consisted of walls of logs with posts guard post built at the top to shoot anyone who crossed the deadline. In that booklet, um, I've got pictures of Andersonville that you can show. I got these off the internet, and uh, perhaps we went to visit Andersonville uh, when it had the 125th uh, anniversary of its closing, and uh, learned an awful lot about it. Uh, it had guard posts built at the top to shoot anyone who crossed the deadline. The prisoners had no protection from the weather, except holes or caves they dug or shelters they built with sticks and blankets. A day's ration was a small piece of cornbread and baked black beans with bugs in it. There was so little food they starved and fell sick, and 130 prisoners died each day. Comrades of the dead made a tag with his name, state, and regiment so that a record was, keep, was kept. Dog tags for soldiers was not invented yet. Before Miller arrived, there was a gang of prisoners that preyed on the others, stealing their food and possessions, beating and killing them. But the prisoners had gotten permission from Captain Wirtz, uh, the commander of the uh, prison, to have a trial, and they hung the raiders. Maybe uh, recently they had a movie about Andersonville on TV. Did you see that? After this, the prisoners formed a police force to keep law and order. The only water came from a polluted creek, so small they called it a branch because it was only five or six inches deep. It was polluted each day by the cookhouse upstream. The prisoners prayed for water, and during a thunderstorm, lightning struck the ground, and a spring of good water came up. 
They named it Providence Spring. It still flows today. They made a cement building over it. Now, when we were down there, it didn't have that building over it. And it said the water was not for drinking, but we drank it anyway. <laughs> In September 1864, Miller and many others were moved to Charleston, South Carolina. This was no better than Andersonville. On October 1st, they were taken to Florence, South Carolina to a hospital, but conditions were so bad, many, many more died. At the end of the war in 1865, they were allowed to go home. Miller saw Abraham Lincoln's body at Columbus, Ohio on his way home because Lincoln had been assassinated. Yeah, this is how thin the prisoners were. And um, when Joshua Willard came home, he was so uh, sick that he only lived 12 more years. At first, Miller was sick and lived with his brother, a farmer at Mud Creek, south of Rochester. He had a bad eye and other afflictions the rest of his life, which came from the terrible experiences at Andersonville. He married Mary Wakefield in 1868 and had three children, Archie, Miller, and Dot. He farmed and lived in a log cabin. He was also a carpenter and helped build Antioch Church. In 1880, he moved to Rochester and clerked in grocery stores. In 1904, he was elected Fulton County Treasurer. The county treasury had only 18,000 $912, so he had to collect unpaid taxes. As treasurer, he borrowed $73,000 for ditches and bridges, which greatly improved the county. He retired in 1901, having gotten the borrowed money paid back, and the county had a balance of $93,000. So he did a good job as treasurer. As a veteran, Miller was a member of the McClung Post of GAR, a Civil War Union Soldiers Club name, meaning Grand Army of the Republic. The last few years of his life, he was not able to get out of his house much. He died in 1916 at age 81. His obituary states that a talking machine, or Victrola, was pay provided music for his uh, funeral. Um, I've got a little bit more about the uh, uniform to tell. Okay. It's, it's in that, too. Uh, the uniform is being loaned by Ted Schaefer of Plymouth, who's a Civil War reenactor. where it's at, but I'll tell what I can. Um, it's made of wool. Uh, the, if you turn around so they can see the back, uh, it's padded on the seat, not so much to protect the man as to protect the, the horse. Well, anyway, the saddle uh, that they had during the Civil War was split down the middle. Any of you ever see a Civil War saddle? So it was a little hard for riding. Uh, he's got a sword. He's got a, uh, um, a carbine. And uh, the pistol, that pistol is unbelievably heavy. I don't know how they could ever even shoot the thing. And it's muzzle loading. You'd ha have the uh, round ball ammunition and uh, use a wooden stick to uh, push it down the barrel. And he's got a canteen. They carried water. Now, some of them put something stronger, make maybe cider in it. <laughs> yeah, right. And uh, uh, the, the leather pouch here on this side is for bullets. And what's the one at the back for, Bill? Haversack carried here. Okay, the haversack we don't have on, and the haversack is a, a canvas bag. And that you carried your food in, your needle and thread, because you needed things like that. Uh, the stripes, I think, indicated he was uh, an officer. Uh, he was in the Indiana 5th Cavalry Company I, same as what Joshua Willard was. So we learned a lot about Bill's ancestor from studying uh, Samuel Miller. Uh, Joshua Willard was in Andersonville too, but they messed up and lost his records. So uh, after, his die, after he died, his wife tried to get a pension, and it took her 10 or 12 years. 
because they lost his records. But Samuel Miller said he saw Joshua Willard at the Andersonville prison. And so he signed a statement that he saw him there. And from that, she finally got a pension, I think at $12 a month for the rest of her life. But by that time, see, her kids had already mostly grown up after 10 or 12 years. So it's hard to, uh, um, military records are always hard to <laughs> find, it seems like. Are there any questions or any comments about the Civil War? <laughs> We're probably behind schedule here, need to move on quick. <laughs> we just have, yeah, good evening. Thank you all. Thanks for Austin, our, our reenactor. Great. Welcome, welcome everyone. Howdy. How are y'all? Well, look at this. What a wonderful turnout. No, my goodness. You know, if you if you've done what you're supposed to be doing upstairs, you don't need a microphone. Okay. Yes. Yes. Well, welcome to my final resting place, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Herman Dakey. And Dakey's the name, safety's the game. I was the uh, safety supervisor for the Erie Railroad for nigh on to 35 years. Now, not all that time was I the... Mr. Dakey? Yes. Could you start over again? Some of the people were, didn't hear you. Oh my gosh, come on folks! Come on folks, I'm dead! I don't have all day! <laughs> no, no, I don't need that. As I was saying, I am Herman Dakey, and I was with the Erie Railroad for over 35 years till I died in 1948. And my goodness, I was doing something I love doing when I passed on. I was at a safety convention over in Cincinnati, Ohio. Fell over dead. Oh. I guess I laid there for about a day before anybody realized it. A lot was going on. A lot was going on. No, no, no. Well, I started out, like I say, with the Erie Railroad. You might wonder, why in the world, Herman, do you have a hat on that says Wabash? Well, you know, eventually the Erie became the Wabash. Got to tell you a little something about heaven. You know, we socialized just like this up there. And one of my good friends, Casey Jones. Everybody know Casey? You bet. Yeah. Well, if you don't, all you got to do is spend two minutes with you and he'll tell you all about it. He was with the Wabash, Wabash Cannonball. And he says, Herman, let's trade hats. Go down there and tell those folks I'm all for safety with the railroad and anything else, too. I said, that's great, Casey. I'll just do that. So Casey sends his regards. Well, back to my story. 1913, I joined the railroad. They had me doing some things like, uh, well, you'd call it today telecommunications, telephone work. So, you know, I was the Bill Willard of the Erie, uh, Erie Railroad back then. But then I soon tired of that, and this position of safety supervisor came up. And I was the fella who was going all over the Midwest and the East Coast promoting this medallion featuring the three children on there who were saying, stop, look, and listen. Now that came about, I didn't come up with that. I was just promoting it. That came about back in 1890, when back on the East, back in the East, we had an incident Remember you giving me this? Then old Billy Willard got a medallion that said, Stop, look, and listen. Uh, well, you hang on to that because this is worth a lot of money today. Absolutely. See, he doesn't let me hold it. Right back. <laughs> but I did. I traveled all over giving those out, promoting huh. this motto. And we were also putting several of these large placards, medallion placards, in schools public buildings and such, so people would always remember when coming to the railroad tracks, the crossings, stop, look, and listen. But like I say, I didn't come up with that. That uh, was created back in about 1890, back in a small town on the east, in the east, when they had a terrible 
catastrophe with a traveling fellow on a horse. And he did not stop, look, and listen. And the judge who was involved, who lived in the community, said, I want everyone, all of our students, all of our travelers, when it comes to these dangerous railroad tracks, to stop, look, and listen. So the Erie picked that up, and that became the motto for the, for the safety program. Well, I spent lots of years traveling, promoting all of that. And uh, as I said earlier, it culminated with my passing away in 1948. Now, I started out on the East Coast also with the Erie in 1913. And uh, I got married, my wife Ellen. We uh, moved to Rochester in 1925. And Rochester became our home. And we were here for 23 years till I passed. And it was the place where I wanted to be buried. I thank my brother back then, Paul Dakey, because Paul and the boys at the Erie had this beautiful monument put right here at my grave. And if you'll notice, it's the only one that faces the railroad tracks. Ah. <laughs> There's a reason for that, too. I was pretty well liked by the boys. And uh, when they'd go by, They'd all wave and give their greetings to Herman. And they said, every once in a while, you could hear a voice coming from the graveyard. Tell Bob Kaywood he owes me money. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not sure about that. <laughs> but that's, uh, that's my story. Now, you notice my pipe, too. Everybody says, oh my gosh, Herman, you were a smoker. Well, yes, we, we did that back then, you know. But you notice I'm not smoking today. No, the good Lord told me, he said, Herman, that smoking will kill you. And I said, Lord, what's your point? <laughs> but he does allow me to keep my pipe and can of Prince Albert candy. Well, I thank you, everyone, for coming to visit. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness, it's long-lost nephew, David, here. David Dakey. My How are you? And your my son, son, Zach. Hi, Zach. How are you? <laughs> nice job. Well, thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Is Bob your son? No, Bob was uh, not my son. He would have been a uh, uh, great uh, nephew. Yes. Now, a lot of people want to know, what the A stands for in my name. Shirley, did you know that? What the A was for my no, name? No, I don't know either. Everybody asks me that. Now, I was raised in an area era where people came up with crazy names like Aloysius. So what I tell people is the A stands for always, always be safe. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hope you enjoy your tour. As you can tell, this is our last stop, and um, this, uh, the person portrayed here um, is Marguerite Miller, who was an author and speaker, and Shirley Willard will tell you about Marguerite, and at this opportunity, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming, and hope you had a good time. Thank you. You, you can live. I'm supposed to ad lib. <laughs> well, anyway, I'm glad it didn't rain. Um, that wouldn't have been nearly as much fun. When you can't talk about anything else, you can always talk about the weather, right? Okay. Thank you very much. Marguerite Miller is a person I've read about a lot because she wrote the Home Folks book. She interviewed the old settlers, and so it's called um, A Series of Stories by Old Settlers of Fulton County, Indiana. It was originally published as two volumes, volume one probably about 1909 and volume two about 1910. She was uh, the editor of the uh, Rochester Republican, which was a newspaper here. 
And as a historian and newspaper columnist, I feel a close connection to Marguerite Miller, but she lived in a different era, 1863 to 1960. She was born during the Civil War and lived to be nearly 100. I wish I had met her, but in 1960 I was a young school teacher with a small son, so I didn't have the opportunity to meet Marguerite Miller. In fact, I had not even heard of her until I started with the Historical Society. We had her book reprinted, I think it was about 1972, and uh, put both volumes in uh, one book. And at that time, the only museum we had was the depot out there by Lakeview Park. And Liz Williams was uh, working for us on the CETA uh, federal program. And uh, she knew that the book, uh, books were supposed to arrive that day, and a truck pulled up with the books. Um, but in the back room of the uh, depot, um, she heard a noise and she went back there to see because she thought maybe a dog had gotten in or maybe a child had come in and she didn't notice. But when the truck came with the books, Liz decided that was Marguerite Miller's spirit that she knew the books were arriving that day. Now the reason I mention this is because Marguerite Miller was a spiritualist. There was a, a spiritualist group around Lake Manitou. I don't know if it still continues. I went to one of the meetings one time. I was very concerned because my mother was very ill and I was afraid she was going to die. And I went to the spiritualist meeting and prayed for her and she got well. Not exactly, but at least she did live to be nearly 90. But Margaret Miller's father was Thomas Major Bitters. He owned the Union Spy and that was another newspaper. And later the Rochester Republican. So when her father died in 1902, the funeral was in the courthouse. So he was a very prominent man. Her brother, Albert Bitters, owned the Rochester Republican until it ceased to exist in 1923. Marguerite worked in the office, setting type and writing. The newspaper office was in the IOF building, the Oddfellows building at the corner of 9th and Main, the one that burned a couple, what is it, five years ago, and they're just now getting uh, brick up to replace where it was. She married John Miller in 1882 and had her only child, a son, Earl Miller, in 1885. And Earl Miller's um, grave is beside hers. So she interviewed the uh, old settlers and um, they told their stories in first person as if, well, she put it, wrote it as if they were telling their stories. Uh, and that's how they told it to her. These men included men who watched the Potawatomi marched at gunpoint down Rochester's Main Street in 1838. Civil War veterans like Samuel Miller that we had at one of the other talks here. Coming to Fulton County in the 1830s. Deer hunting, farming, being a prisoner in Andersonville. History of Rochester's brass bands, Oddfellows history being a conductor on the Underground Railroad, and much more. This is an extremely valuable book, and it's a good thing we had it reprinted. We still have a few copies for sale at the museum, and one of these days we may have to reprint it again. But they were first published in the Rochester Republican newspaper, just like my column comes out each Saturday in the Sentinel, and then eventually they got put together as a book. So the book sold well. It's such a valuable book, it's kind of like a Bible to historians. When I became president of uh, the Fulton County Historical Society in 1971, we decided to have the home folks reprinted. And then we decided to continue her work by writing Fulton County Folks, Volume 1. And then later we did Fulton County Folks, Volume 2. <laughs> so we kind of continued in her footsteps, and I wrote a lot of those stories. Volunteers are indexing Volume 2 so it can be reprinted, but it's so big it has to be divided in half. It had over 600 pages. So to put an index on it, we will cut it in half. And um, There's a B after me, Bill. Oh, so you're sweet. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Notice how helpful he is. <laughs> okay. Um, after her husband's death in 1924, Marguerite um, entered the lecture field and traveled all over the United States as a Chautauqua speaker. Now, Chautauqua was a very fav famous um, program where they would travel from town to town and set up uh, programs. And here in Rochester, there were Chautauqua speakers in the old opera house. Did you know Rochester had an opera house and Chautauqua speakers and all that? Well. She tells about that. 
Uh, one of her speeches was called Making Your Dreams Come True and Love the Emancipator. I'm not sure what Love the Emancipator. Oh, maybe it's Love is the Emancipator. That might be what she's thinking. An audience in California liked her so much they took up a collection and presented her with a string of pearls which she wore to give speeches from then on. Well, I didn't have... See, I got a pearls on, but they're not like the ones she had. Bill, will you come over here, please? <laughs> this is her. That's her with her string of pearls. And uh, um, eventually we uh, were given them for the museum, but uh, the pearls were no longer in a string. They were in a little box, so we never did get them restrung. But we got the little box in the, of the pearls. Um, her father became a spiritualist the last 20 years of his life, and Marguerite was the leader of the Lake Manitou spirituals, spiritualists. Uh, Gladys Hall was a close friend of Marguerite Miller. Gladys had tuberculosis and had to sleep on the outdoor porch of her home at 916 Franklin Street. That was the treatment, you know, for tuberculosis back in those days, sleep outdoors. I remember that. <laughs> Marguerite visited her and uh, prayed for her and many sick people. Gladys gave Marguerite's photo and posters to the Fulton County Museum. Uh, Gladys gave the pearl necklace to her niece, Marie Wyden, and later Marie gave it to the museum, but the string had broken and we've never gotten it restrung. Marguerite passed on her writing ability to her son, Earl Miller. He wrote a column uh, with local history and his memories for the Rochester Sentinel while he was employed as director of Fulton County Welfare. His columns contain memories of his silent movie theater in the Knapp building, again that odd fellows building, <laughs> which burned. Uh, he wrote about other early theaters and such topics as the first basketball games, Rochester hotels, buildings now gone, and is a very valuable history resource. So we owe a lot to uh, Marguerite and her son Earl Miller for their writings about early Fulton County history and also for inspiring me to be a writer and dig in and I'm always telling people we learn new history every day. I learn things from uh, what Ted said today and what Marie Kelsey said and, and what Alan said, things that I hadn't done as much research on. Caroline and I wrote the basic stories and gave it to them and then they did some more research and it's just wonderful what you can do with the internet research now. It's easier and faster than it used to be when you had to ride a horse and buggy to talk to people to get their memories, <laughs> things like that. So thank you all for coming. Caroline, did you have anything more to say? I'm over here, but no. I'm okay. Do <laughs> <laughs> you think we should do this again next year? Yeah. All right. With different people? Yeah. Okay. If you're interested and want to be a volunteer, well, we'll dress you up. <laughs> yeah. You can dress yourself. So thank you. I think there's about 35 people came. Yeah, great. Maybe 40. Yeah. <laughs>